Okay, welcome everyone. Today we have Roman Younger, uh, who is the leader of the computational linguistics research group in the University of Helsinki. Uh, Hi. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about language learning and the tools that we're building for uh, supporting language learning. I have rather a lot of stuff to show, so I'll go through very quickly. So uh, please stop me if anything's unclear. Uh, and, uh, sorry, I'm at the kind of Same, it won't get any bigger than that. Is, is it readable to everybody else? No problems. Yeah. It's pretty much as big as it gets. <laughs> okay. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the plan. I'll give you a short overview of, um, of the various components of the system that we have. And then I'll show a bit of a demo. And then the most uh, interesting part is I'll uh, try to discuss some of the uh, problems that we're working on to give you an idea of what this is. So a bit of background, this is done at the University of Helsinki, uh, at the well, computational linguistics group that I lead, um, <clears throat> as part of the project of computer science. And this work uh, is uh, kind of the outcome of uh, a series of two academy projects. Um, originally, we started with uh, tools for supporting less resourced and endangered languages, specifically the Ural languages. I use it in Finnish. Uh, there's lots of them in Russia that are in uh, endangered state. And eventually, out of that came uh, the idea to support language learning in general. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, the key point is this: that if you can take away anything from this talk at all. The main thing here is that we are focusing on learners who have gone beyond the beginner level. Okay, so you know, you're probably familiar with lots and lots of um, web-based applications for elementary language learning. There's really a lot of them that apply to computation. Uh, this is not what we do. So this is not for beginners at all. Right? So you have to have mastered the basics, basic grammar, basic vocabulary. There's 500 problems there. You need to move forward in those. So this, it really changed the problem. It's a very different thing. You'll see, hopefully, as as um, as we progress, that this is not a this is not for beginners, but it's for needed, intermediate, and advanced learners. And uh, so the users are so-called high-stakes users. So these are people who are committed to learning for one reason or another. They're not going to quit like like might happen uh, with beginner learners or casual learners. Uh, so there's several categories of high-stakes users. One that was the original target group was these so-called heritage speakers. So these are people who have a lot of passive knowledge. They grew up in a, maybe in a uh, setting where grandparents or parents spoke the language, but the language went into misuse. So they have passive knowledge, but not, uh, lack active competency. So that's what we focus on: is activating that competency. Uh, migrants, for example, in Finland, same story. Right? So these are people who are committed to learning for the long term. Uh, and of course, there's university and high school eligibility. So the high stakes means that you're committed for either to get a job or to get citizenship or class courses or whatever you can. Okay, these are the languages that are covered in the platform, the major languages, and these are the endangered languages. Uh, Finnish, Russian, German, they're uh, actually Kazakh is also in very good shape. We have lots of linguists working with us and contributing uh, language teachers as well as linguists in all these languages, actually in all of them. Uh, when you see the little data there, that means it's more data. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. But the system is scalable. The system doesn't care very much about the language, so we can add more languages if we go. Uh, collaborators are tuned to me. Uh, of course, we have the University of Helsinki Department of Finnish, the people there work with us in Finnish, Department of Modern Languages, they work with us in several other languages, including Russian. The University of the US is a very important collaborator. These are they have Center for Applied Center for Applied Linguistic Studies, CALS. Um, these are people who are who are mandated. Uh, they, they have a kind of monopoly on, on, on all of Finland. They they do certified tests in Finland. They run the tests for all the assignments for the board of education, and they cover nine languages that were on the previous. Most of them were on the previous slide. These are these are the languages in which you can get certified in Finland. 
at the level of CF A1. And several other partner universities that we, that we work with. Um, okay, so the main goals of, of our work is that the system should complement should complement or somehow emulate a good teacher. So what goes into a good teacher? A good teacher is defined as follows. He knows the subject matter, uh, obviously. Uh, next, he should know what the learner knows or does not know. Okay. And finally, he should, in those two things, he should also know what the learner is best prepared to learn next. Okay. And these are, this is what we call next skills. There's some other terms in, in uh, pedagogy literature that are used for this. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. But this is the key idea. So you want to give the actually the things that the learner is prepared to learn best. If you don't, uh, if the exercises that you give are too easy to often, then you will bore the learner and they quit. Or if the exercises are too hard too often, then you discourage the learner, you frustrate them, and they quit there. Right? So you have to really find that exact level. And that's where a lot of the work ends up going. So these are the key ideas. And inside the system, there are three components, three major components. We didn't invent this. This is kind of standard. This is what people do in, in general in the tutoring systems. Uh, Intelligent tutoring systems is a big, huge deal. <clears throat> has nothing to do with language. Uh, anytime you want to tutor somebody, you have these three major components. You have the main model, which covers the subject matter, you have the student model, and you have the instruction model. These are, these are the components that teach, that tell you how to navigate. So these next skills, uh, the buzzword in the uh, educational data science is zone of proximal development. We'll talk about that. This is what you're best prepared to learn next. And it comes from some Russian philosopher who wrote about this 100 years ago. Um, right, so uh, other goals that we have, aside from these key, key goals, is we want to adapt to the learner's interest. So we don't want to bore the learner with uninteresting content. And also, we don't want to bore the learner with repetitive content. And for that, what we try to do is we try to allow the learner to use any content that she likes for learning. Whatever you know, you're interested in politics or horses or football or whatever. So you should be able to use that to learn the language. And then we want to also be able to generate an unlimited variety of exercises so that they don't repeat and you know basically get away from the textbook. This is how the models uh, interact. So from the from the exercises that we give to the learner, we collect that all the student responses, correct responses, incorrect responses, everything gets stored forever in the database. And based on the student history, we then build the student model. And here we have the domain model that describes the subject. So this is where the language knowledge is. This is how the language is structured. This is how Russian is structured for Asian. And from those, there's this instruction model, which then feeds into here and says, OK, this is the next best exercise to do. OK, this is kind of hand waving, but this is just to give you. Please ask if anything is unclear. OK? So as we said before, the key point is to stimulate active learner's production rather than passively memorizing things you want to activate the uh, production of language. Allow the learner to upload stories that she most is interested in to maximize practice time, generate exercises automatically using lots of NLP tools that I'll show in a bit. And then assessment becomes uh, a key problem for all those reasons that I said. Assessment of exact level of and we try to, of course, do the assessment based on the answers given so far, based on the data. Right? We don't do interviews like, how well do you think you know the language? It's based on the actual responses. And there's lots of skills to cover. Since we can't talk about everything today, there's grammar, vocabulary, listening, listening comprehension, right? So speech comprehension. Uh, and also, we need to be able to, to, to test uh, how well the learner is able to speak. So this we've already begun working on. This is future work. These are key components that are, they have to do with audio, and they are kind of coming later. Um, so reading and writing, uh, the system will uh, test rather well. But for the audio communication, uh, we are just in the, in the earlier stages of working on that. And, and then there's, I don't have a first to write. Yeah. So, 
the uh, practice mode, we try to be careful with this. I don't know if you know this uh, buzzword. Uh, oops. So that's about gauging the purpose. That's something I learned at a recent educational data science conference. Uh, uh, so gamification is important. It should be fun. It should be entertaining. So there are lots of different types of exercises that we give, and I'll go through them in a, in a second. So this is, uh, just to give you an idea, this is what the basic, what we call the basic practice mode. The learner chooses a text, and it can be any text from anywhere. Did I talk somewhere? Um, and then we present the text, so there's a story. It's all based on the text that the, the learner chose. And then the story is presented in pieces, or paragraphs, or some smaller pieces. And in each, we call them snippets. And in each snippet, some of the phrases are uh, taken away, they're hidden. And, and the quizzes are they, uh, the unnoticed. So for example, close quizzes, these are fill in the blank type of exercises. Or we write some hide word, we give, we give the user, show the user face form, and uh, he has to uh, figure out what the right word to use in that context, or right phrase to use in that context. Multiple choice quizzes, etc. Sorry, that's yeah. the uh, user hints. So yes. I'm always the person is supposed to know what the word they're going to guess is if they haven't seen the text before. Exactly, right. Well, he's also, he or she is free to look at the text before. That doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt the learning process. It doesn't go against the sort of, I don't want to get into the philosophy, but, we, but there's lots of different ways to do it. But yes, we, I mean, the basic form uses the hints like this. So here's, a, here's an example. This is from the actual text that we got somewhere from, from Intermediate Finish. Uh, it says, token is kept on monument, and here's the hint. Right? So there's a word here where the base form is Kiria. Uh, so for those of you who don't speak Finnish, this is the translation. Topelio says, so the idea is that he says about that in his book called Our Land, uh, tells about various promises. But you just get the book, and you have to put it in the right case, and so you should find something like this. Okay? This is kind of the basic. And the correct form is the form found in the story, and the letter receives immediate feedback uh, about his answers. He also receives some help, we'll see in a second. And the answers, of course, are stored forever, and you based a lot of help you get. Okay, any questions? This is kind of the basic idea. I can show you how it works, if it works. Um, assuming that it works okay. So here's a story that I wrote just before I came, just to make sure that things are working. This is from, right, so the idea is we'll put here, and you can put in your stories from anywhere you like, right? Either from a file, or you can just dump them into this window, or you can open a web page like this. So here's one of my favorite sites. I go to simple finish. Is that the right place? Yeah, so this is Ule produces Finnish uh, stories in simplified Finnish for people like me and lots of other people here. Um, so they're in Finnish, and you click, you know, you just take the URL, well, I just did that, and I, I put the story in here, and after a couple of seconds, uh, we get the stories up here, and these are things you can do with the stories, and, and more. So if we go to the story, from, uh, okay, let's start from the beginning, you get something like this. This is about the elections. Okay, maybe that stays in Brazil. So we can have a high quality. That's not so easy. Well, maybe it is Coca or or is it Keta? No, I don't know. Keta. Well, we can leave it and see what I mean. See what I would say. I would leave it Coca. What? You had a book. Yeah. Okay. It's good to see that. Okay. So that I'm an illustrator. Okay, maybe it's a little bit boring because they are uh, very, very tense. Uh, I can't no. read to this too far. What is something that's a say folly? I don't know. Okay, let's make a mistake here. This is a typical mistake that I would do as a non Finnish speaker. And, uh, yeah. 
it's more natural for me to put it into plural because that works many of them. I don't know. I don't know, whatever. Um, and this is what I get back. Everything was wrong, <laughs> uh, except for verified. So now I have a second chance. Um, this is not, okay, anyway, so we can correct this. Let's correct one of them. Oops, okay. So she's, she also pronounces things. We can turn it off if you don't like it. So this should be Edertasta. And this should be. Eduskuntavaali. Sorry. I'll turn it off for a second. So it should be Eduskuntavaali in the end? Or? Yeah. And this is probably mine, and let's leave that one alone. And then it checks and it tells me which was right, which was wrong. And uh, this one is, so also let's get that. Yeah. Well, how do you choose which uh, which verse to ask? Oh, I'm getting to that. That's the that's the fascinating part. That's the more difficult part. Um, it's it's based on it's based on what it thinks I know and don't know. That's the short answer. But the long answer is, but that's the key point, right? We want to choose exactly the, the best word, uh, and so on, and it, con and it continues. Uh, there's an interesting example here that I just spotted, which I want. I, I don't want to keep doing this. We can keep playing with it. By the way, you can log in there and play with it at your leisure. It's, it's open. Uh, but um, I just well, whatever. Uh, the interesting example is here. What would you put here? Just a very short sentence at the end. You know what on on the fucking. So I would have answered that. Probably okay. Uh, keep that and then and then we answer the other ones. Um, yeah, we don't. Okay, we it, it doesn't give me a second chance for for technical reasons. We we assume that because the the user didn't catch all the questions, he doesn't want to see the answers. So he really should do all the all the exercises. Then he gets a second. But the correct answer there was post this stuff. Um, is it actually not so good? No. Different meaning. Both are okay, yeah. Yeah, but the point is that both are valid in the context. So let's keep that thought for later, okay? So it's not, the, the problem should be clear, right? So the user might put in something that might make sense to him, maybe slightly different meaning, but the context doesn't restrict you one way or the other. There's some freedom. So it's not always possible to say correct and correct. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, there's more features that I'd like to show that are not popping up in this story. Maybe we'll get better luck if we open a Russian story. Let's see. Just to see. Yeah. Oh, okay. I have to. Sorry. I have to do this. I have to try to answer them to get a second chance. So here's the snippet. It's rather big. So I try all of these things. See if we get some good. Yeah, so this is part of the hint that it tries to give back to you. It says that, it, it tells you which words are coordinated so that they should be in the same case or in the same number, it's like that, you know, so if you, or if a certain preposition, uh, you know, how does it work? You know about the meaning of wopsy. You know, so wopsy requires that it should be genitive and button requires that it should be part of it, things like that. So it tries to give you that kind of uh, help along the way to guide you to the right answer, not just to tell you this is right, this is wrong, and so on. Okay, to continue with our story. So that's the basic idea. Uh, yeah, and maybe you didn't see this here, but one of the things that happens is if there's a word that I don't know, it gets pronounced. If I choose, but the main thing is that I get I get uh, the analysis here, and you know, if you a compound, uh, so I get the translation into a language of my choice, from some dictionaries that we found, various places, and so on. So all the all the words that I'm not familiar with, maybe are difficult, I can look them up. But the key point is that they go into my stack of flashcards that I can practice vocabulary with later. And, and there's some Something built in there to drive the vocabulary practice with so called kind repetition, which other, other people who do language learning as well. Uh, and you can add your own flashcards and 
can share flashcards with friends, and we can share stories with friends, and so on. And it also makes crosswords, like based on that story that I downloaded, I can also make a crossword that I have a picture of it. Uh, look something like this. This is based on that same story that I showed you, and you, you know, basically the hints you get again are in the language, and you have to fill in the crossword bit by bit. Lots of different types of exercises. You get the idea. So the idea is that with the same story, the same content, since I like it, I don't mind going through it two or three times, and maybe at the third time, maybe I just forget the crossword, but I don't mind learning uh, the language from that story because I'm interested in the content anyway. So I, I might do that with some new stories every day or every couple of new stories. Okay, so that's kind of the overview. This is what happens with the flashcards once you've, uh, once you've uh, accumulated some of them here. You know, you get a set of 50 at a time, and then you practice with these. Actually, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't get a hint for this. Uh, I, what's, what's something to do with giving? I don't know. Or, how do we, well, we don't know, so we give up. We look up the answer, we lose a point. Uh, Delivery issuance, okay, and then we continue. Lack of data. And if I don't remember what's there, I can uh, I can click, of course, because the system knows everything about me, so it knows where I saw that in my previous days or months of practice, where I saw this. It remembers all the instances where this particular word occurred, so it can give that to me as hints, and I can say, okay, maybe if I read that, aha, uh -huh, so maybe, I don't know, I might guess that it means um, health science or medicine, I don't know. You know, I guess right, and we can see. Okay, so you get the picture, hopefully. This is the setup. And there's a big NLP pipeline, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, lots of uh, NLP components that kind of tear the text apart. And, and, right. So a bit about the instruction model. So the Vita keeps a complete history of correct and incorrect answers, as I said. And for a given learner, we use the history to compute the weights for these candidates. So this is kind of the naive approach. Maybe I'll talk about it when, when we get to the different models. Uh, I don't want to spend the time now. Okay, so that's the setup. If you have any, any questions, just ask. I'll now talk about the problems that we're working on. Okay? And there's really a lot of problems, but I, for today, I will if I'm lucky, I'll just get through these three. Disambiguation, uh, assessment, and multiple discipline. They're, they're by no means of equal importance, but they're just interesting things that I thought I'd talk about. Okay, so what is disambiguation about? So surface form, meaning a, a word that you find in the text, uh, is, a more, is considered morphologically ambiguous if it has more than one of Well, actually, this is not a good exact definition, but, but this is the idea, right? So you have a form like ulen in the text, and it has two base forms. It might have base form tula and another one tula. If anyone doesn't understand my linguistic jargon, please just stop me. Okay? I assume that you follow otherwise. Base form is the vocabulary, is the dictionary form. But, right? So this could be a form of the verb to come, or it could be a form of the noun to follow. Okay? That's just how the human works. So it has two morphological analyses that can be used. And this is common for all languages. Uh, this kind of ambiguity occurs. In Russian, we have examples of this. So how do we deal with this ambiguity? Why do we want to deal with this ambiguity? Well, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. If I find a story here, uh, anybody see an ambiguous word? This is an ambiguous word. Toy. Okay. So it could mean butter. It could mean they want to do something. So I assume butter avoids so it, it probably means the that one can follow uh, the elections on on television radio. So it's probably not the butter meaning. It also has this, this little extra meaning there. 
But okay, but the point is there's two different lemmas, at least two different, well, or three, depending on how you uh, parse this. And the idea is that we want to be able to tell the user which one is right. It's not, it's not as informative, and, and in this case, uh, the model would actually be able to guess correctly. So from the context, you should be able to tell that this is not talking about butter, it's talking about table logic. Okay, so how would you do such a thing? So people have built lots of language models for, you know, this, this is a very well known problem. It's an essential problem in machine translation. Obviously, like, because if you translate boy, you need to know which boy you're talking about. Uh, so I hope that's clear to everyone. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, and one way of doing it is through, uh, through, well, this is basically through chunking, you know, that is in, in, in NLP, natural language parsing, it's very localized parsing. So if you have very local hints, they might give you an idea about what the storage should be. So you might use those very local hints in, in a rule-based fashion. This is kind of what people use before. So you might have rules that say, uh, if you have an adjective and a noun, and they agree in case, they agree in number, they agree in gender, if you have gender and finish, you did, you could, then they kind of, they create a chunk. And then if one of those guys is ambiguous, you can say, well, forget about any, uh, any, any ambiguity there, because, uh, just use the part of speech that fits this chunk. This is one way to do it. Or this is uh, in my head. Don't I have a finish example? Yeah, this is more finish, right? Uh, so you have adjectives and nouns, they agree in case and number, or you have a postposition which wants a certain case. How my the employee in works? So it works, he only works with gender. So it's genitive. So if you're not sure if something here is ambiguous, then you can help this ambiguity. But this is not a good way, you know, a rule rule based way. So uh, we would like to have a more uh, it's very hard to write these rules. It just doesn't work. So people do it using uh, various statistical approaches. So obviously, how, you know, so if you have to stop and think, well, how would you solve this problem with boy? And lots of other problems like that, what would you do? And the obvious thing is that Google, of course, certainly can handle this problem very well. If I gave that sentence to Google, it would have no problem, right? So uh, this is a kind of a solved problem. Right, so I can show you an example here. You can pull up the translator. Okay, I can't think of any example that I thought of here. Let me translate into English. So I typed squirrels and bears sat in the forest. Yes, exactly. And it translated perfectly. Okay. But the problem <coughs> is this word here is ambiguous, the first word. It could mean squirrels or it could mean proteins. All right? But Google knows that with, you know, if they're sitting with bears, then it's probably squirrels. So if I change this word, um, To carbohydrates, it, it knows that, right? It, it figures out. No problem. <clears throat> um, I can't think of it, my finish is not as good uh, to come up with a, uh, to, with a quick example like that, but that's the idea. This is what we're after. So this kind of gives you a, a sense that Google might be the poor man's disintegration machine. If you, if you, wanted to, you probably could, you know, twist things around to get this integration for free. But it's a very, uh, well, it's, it's basically a huge overkill, right? It's a very heavy machine to do. Google tries to solve a much more complicated problem. And they, uh, yeah, there's another key point, is that they use massive parallel corpora to train these models to do this, to do this translation, because the integration comes in, uh, comes in for free. Um, <clears throat> So there's two things that we don't like. One is that we don't want to have the supervision. We want to be able to do that to, to disintegrate in an unsupervised way. 
And the other is that we are hoping that because we're attacking a simple problem, we might be able to achieve better performance. Uh, and the other thing is that Google's problem of machine translation, it's not mission critical. And this is the key point. I think this, this is my second uh, take home message for today. Uh, if Google messes up on the squirrels and proteins, whatever, yeah, you're not going to stop using Google. But if you're a student who's trying to learn a language and the system guides you in the wrong way, will you come back again? I wouldn't, you know, the trust really drops very quickly, right? So it's the same idea as, you know, the early NLP system, if you saw the, uh, this is the question they always ask, you know, is your, good, is your system good enough that you would trust it to guide a missile to hit some, <laughs> some place? You know, this is, this is what I mean by mission critical, right? This is not going to be, uh, you know. So we, what, basically what this comes down to is that the, the usual trade-off between recall and precision between accuracy and, and, uh, and completeness is not available in this setting. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot trade these things off. Okay, and that that uh, casts the problem, or actually everything that we're dealing with, in a somewhat different way. You cannot afford to make mistakes. We're not doing the least because you're the teacher. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe you could uh, somehow motivate the student to spot the uh, errors in the system. So, so I'm positive that this is wrong uh, and give them extra credit for that. <laughs> yes, yes. And in fact, there's a huge, we're, we're, part, uh, we're part of this huge network on crowdsourcing in, in, uh, in there's, there's lots of people, really hundreds of people working along, actually along these lines, where you kind of give this, empower the student to, to say, well, if we make a mistake, you have the power to make it better. But uh, it's not clear yet. <laughs> To what extent people will accept that model? And, and, and yeah, it's 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 an open question. Anyway, so how would we do that if we didn't have Google? So here's one proposal. This is actually the paper that we recently submitted. So we use one of these. Uh, this is the neural network. That is, um, uh, it's a modification. This, these were very common before the transformer uh, architecture came along. Um, it's a, it's, I mean, it looks crazy, but it's. For, for today, it's already quite basic. Um, it's a uh, network that enables us to learn uh, to solve a disintegration problem in a unsupervised fashion. So we feed in lots of examples uh, where so the sentence is coming here on the input side, and then we look up the embeddings for all the words, and we feed them through this machine. Uh, well, maybe it's just to, to, to take a second uh, to explain how the machine works. So this LSTM, this is a long short-term memory uh, sub-network here, which basically what it does is it accumulates the left context, let's say the preceding 10 words and the preceding 20 words. And it uh, encodes the left context into a single vector of a fixed length. So this could be variable length, but this could be fixed. And symmetrically, the same thing happens on the right side. Another LSTM, this is a recurrent neural network, for those of you who don't know, we'll talk about later what this looks like. But it's a, <coughs> Uh, it gives you a representation for the right context, okay? For variable length right context that's not into a, uh, gets encoded into a fixed length vector. And then these two vectors together with the target word for the embedding the target word, they get concatenated, and this gets passed to a MLP, <coughs> a multi-layer perceptron, which is a fully connected network, and you get the, this next uh, representation for the context, and based on that, we try to do the prediction. So this is a this is just a projection matrix, which maps to whatever it is that we're trying to predict. And we try to predict two different things here. We try to predict the um, we try to predict the lemmas, and we try to predict the parts of speech. And we submit data based on that. Okay. So this guy is ambiguous. Both the lemmas are ambiguous, and the parts of speech are ambiguous. And so there's two different machines actually. One tries to predict which lemma this should be, and one tries to predict whether it should be a verb or not. And this you're able to train without any uh, label at all. Because you can train it on lots and lots of context where this word is not ambiguous. Okay, that's the idea. And we get the performance like this, and then you can be the judge whether this is good enough or. <coughs> 
So this is for Finnish and for Russian, it's contested. Uh, so this is the amount of ambiguity that's found in the text. For some reason, Russian is much more ambiguous, okay, whatever. Um, and the performance you get is basically of these ambiguous forms, this may get disambiguated with the best model, and this may get disambiguated by Russian. So the Russian is a little bit easier for against the problem. But we're still here in the 70s and 90s. But then, of course, the network is, is still quite a basic architecture, and we could use more intelligent attention based networks. Right, so this is of the ambiguous tokens, uh, what the performance looks like. Maybe a little bit depressing, but overall token accuracy, it looks very good because, of course, most tokens are not ambiguous. So it looks it looks very, very good. And this is how it compared to the state of the art. So this is a little bit better. But that, that just gives you an idea of the, um, the kind of problems that it entails. Okay? Uh, now, about the assessment, this is a key point, as I mentioned, for two reasons. One is because you want to be able to give feedback back to the user. You've reached this level. Right? And the other reason we want assessment is because assessment is what drives the choice of exercise. It's that zone of proximal development. And uh, the simple approach to doing this might be like this. We might say our domain model is just a flat set of constants. So I have that here, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Uh, so we have some linguists who sit down and help us. And they say the language has these concepts right, that we need to master. So there's, you know, these have to do with aspect and tensor. You know, can do you know? Have you mastered the result? Whatever that is, you know, there's and there's there's hundreds of these. So these are kind of the concepts that you want the student to master about verbs of motion and so on. It's just a set. And the uh, so that's our domain model. This is what you should learn. And we don't think about any relationships inside that. Uh, and the student model, based on that domain model, might be viewed as a table. So we might think of it like this, that uh, each one of these is a different student. And inside each box here, it tells us how well the student knows this concept. It's a basic approach. Okay. Um, and already with that, we could build a, an instruction model like this that will say, uh, again, this is quite simple. So think of it like this. It's just like a, a, a stepping stone. So you can have an instruction model that says like this. So if you if your examples, <clears throat> if there's some concept for which you're always answering correctly, right? Out of the my set of 200 concepts there. And the examples that correspond to that, those concepts, you always answer them correctly. Then perhaps they should receive a little bit lower probability the next time you come, because you've got the concept. If you always answer them wrong, you should always probably, you should also probably receive lower, give, give lower probability to that exercise, because you have no chance. You're not doing it. But if you're some, sometimes answering correctly and sometimes incorrectly, then maybe that's a good exercise to give. Okay, that gives you an idea of what we're after in these instruction models. But this is still very basic. And then you throw in some randomness there, and off you go. You have a practicing, uh, you have a system for practicing uh, that is somewhat intelligent. But a more intelligent thing to do would be to say, no, the domain model should have some kind of, should impose some kind of structure on, on these concepts. And uh, the most interesting thing that we could come up with is this precedence relation. Okay, so concept A precedes concept B. We, we would like to say that it's prerequisite, for example, for concept B. Right? You, need, you must know A before you know B. Or somehow it precedes, right? So most students learn A before they learn B. And that gives us a, a, a possibility of structure. So if you think of, of the arithmetic domain, all of these things, by the way, are applied uh, in, in uh, tutoring systems for, for there's some companies in the United States which make uh, tens of millions of dollars from the American government every year by building tutoring systems like this for basic sciences, you know, biology, mathematics, and stuff like that. It's a very common thing, but it's not done for language. 
So you might say that, okay, you want to teach it, but you want, before you go to teach subtraction, you probably should learn addition. And before you learn multiplication, you also should probably learn addition. But between these two, there may not be a relationship. You may choose one or the other. Okay, and again, to, to get to division, you probably want to be able to do both of those, maybe. So this is the prerequisite relation. And so the idea is that we would like to learn these relations based on the data. So currently we have some of limited data, but I'll show you in a second that we're actually able to learn interesting relations already. So we have about a thousand students, and we have about 150 concepts, like I showed you in the previous case. And half a million responses from those students. It looks like a big number, but it actually isn't. You know, on average, it's not so much. There are some students who are very, very active, and some who give just a few responses. So what can we do with this data? So this is just raw data, students giving right and wrong answers. Right? So I have the slide hidden behind here. Um, oops. So we can learn these types of graphs. Um, this is quite big. There's only 150 concepts here. Uh, but it looks kind of, oh, here's another graph. So these are precedence graphs. How are they learned? Well, they learn like this. Think like this is student A, student B. And imagine if uh, there is some concept. No, this is not what I'm trying to say. This is concept A, this is concept B. And these are all my thousand students. And imagine now that for this concept, all these numbers are big in an extreme case. All these numbers are bigger than all of these numbers correspondingly. What does that tell me? That tells me that all my students, or maybe most of them, right, they might be able to drop a few, but most of the students have mastered this and have not, or are doing better on this than are doing better on that. That kind of implies that this is a harder concept. Maybe. And we, can, we can build some structure in it. And I just showed you how that structure is. Okay, so this is what we call a more intelligent. Uh, a more intelligent um, uh, set of models, but the most intelligent one is here, and that is uh, th that is based on a thing called knowledge space theory, where people represent <clears throat> a domain model like this. So this is a so the prerequisite relations are known. Either we learned them from data, or we got them from experts. That's what people normally do. They sit down with uh, hundred experts and get get out of it, you know, does I perceive G or not, or the meaning of it. So the domain looks like this. So it looks, it's a graph where each node is a possible state for a student. So basically, the point of each state is that it's not a, it's possible state, meaning that it's not, it doesn't violate the domain structure. So how could it not violate the domain structure? For example, if in here there is, uh, there's H and one of the prerequisites of H is missing. That's not a possible state. All the prerequisites have to be in that mode. Okay, and that gives a stru structure like that. Okay. Is it uh, uh, made with the experts or learn from the data? Or this is just a like, model? This is just an example, yeah. right? So it's usually the people get it out of the experts, but we're trying to learn from the data. Yeah. Uh, but you understand the idea behind the knowledge. So this is now what we call our domain model. This is a more sophisticated way to view the domain. And the student model, if you have the main model like that, is you see this node is, I don't know if you can see it, I can have this, it is a little red. So basically, what you do a student model is a probability distribution over this, over these nodes. That's the model for one student. That, each, each distribution describes one student. So for each student, you have a distribution that says, okay, he's most likely to be in this node, and maybe in this node, and less likely to be anywhere else. And that gives you a, that gives you a student model. Where is where is most likely to be, and the instruction model in that case is exactly this what you see here, right? So the edges that lead out of the highest probability, the highest where, where most of density is concentrated, the edges that lead out of there, those are the things that he's precisely to prepare as learning outcomes. So this is why we try so hard to get all of this stuff out of there. Okay, and I think I'm out of time. <clears throat> yeah, and the the. Um, this is what it looks like with five concepts, and with 150 concepts, it looks more like this. So there's millions and millions of nodes. It's quite huge. And uh, 
yeah, I'll just run through quickly uh, just, to, just to finish up. So other ways that we, we do assessment is we, we have implemented a uh, ELO based, um, ELO is how many people per chest? Okay, two, three. <laughs> so you're familiar with the rating system for chess, but this has been already imported into many online games uh, and so on. So this is a way, this is basically um, viewing your, uh, <coughs> viewing your setting as a zero sum game. So in chess, you basically say, if I'm playing you and I'm rated much lower than you and I beat you, then I get lots of points from you and you lose exactly the same amount of points as you. But if I'm rated much lower than you and I lose to you, which more or less meets the expectation, then I lose very, very few points on that. And it's possible to learn the ratings for the students. And so, right, so where is the chess uh, setting here? Uh, we view the students on one hand and the exercises that they do as chess players. <coughs> so each time a student attempts an exercise, that's a chess player. And the student either gets points from the exercise or loses points from the exercise. And even actually, it turns out that even though it's a really bipartite world, that you know, you know, they don't exercises don't play with each other. Um, but it turns out not 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 to help at all. But but using that, we can get we can get ratings for students which correspond rather well, not 100% perfectly, but they correspond rather well with their actual. Uh, assessments that teacher give them, um, teachers give them on, um, on tests that they do, especially design for, for language learning. And the last thing that I would, that, <coughs> excuse me, the last thing that I wanted to mention was this multiple, admiss multiple admissibility problem. Remember the example, post it post it So, um, right. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to have a system that says correct and correct, right? So incorrect means correct means you you got it, whatever was in the test you found it, and incorrect is no, nope, you know, uh, it's, it's not what's in the text. You want to have a third alternative that says, well, what you said was actually correct in this context, exactly that example, right? Uh, but it just happens to be not what the author used, and because you like the author, you chose it yourself after all, right? So you want to learn from the author. You want to style of speaking, whatever, you don't mind, you don't mind this. But what you would mind, or you might mind, is calling this incorrect. Um, and again, stop to think how we would do this. And uh, it requires a very sophisticated language models. And uh, I already talked about this, that we cannot create these things all. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I guess I have, I have some preliminary results there, but I, I, I will skip it for now. Just to give you an idea, this is, uh, this is really quite tough, and it's really quite important, but yeah, this is basically it. So um, uh, one last note for you to take, away, take, take home, uh, at least I believe language learning is what I would call an NLP complete problem. You basically need to solve all of NLP <laughs> to, to do this really well. Uh, or maybe AI will be, you know, it's, it's a maybe even bigger. Uh, we build on lots and lots of resources. Not much more obviously you've seen. Uh, text to speech and speech to text. This is coming. Well, you already saw some of the speaking exercises. I don't know if you noticed. But um, still quite rudimentary in here. <coughs> Why am I not getting speaking exercises? That probably turned off. Yes, they were turned off. Uh, so if I go back, some of the exercises will be auditory exercises. Oh, now it's switched to Russian. Yeah. Don't fall off. You have to pick it up and, and so on. <coughs> Again, uh, this is all very rudimentary. The idea is to to try to give the uh, the listener a context from which he has to pick out words and phrases uh, based on just uh, just the listening, and also to evaluate his ability to produce speech. So all of these are various NLP components based on which we can try to make the system 
uh, okay, I've already covered all of this. You're, please feel free to play with the system and figure out what this address Vita.cs.com. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the uh, In the beginning, you specified that your uh, goal is to, uh, to teach people to speak more actively. So, active mm -hmm. so do you think this kind of slot screen task will do the job? <coughs> or have you tested? Um, uh, okay, so how would I say? I guess the short answer would be that we, we can't do everything, but maybe we can do 20%, you know, that would both well be, at least the teachers that we're working with, they are so happy and so grateful that even 20, you know, because these, these guys really have, uh, it's, it's normal for them to have 100 and 200 students in the class. And so if we can offload some of this load for the teachers that, you know, some small percentage of the, um, of the training that we need to provide to the students um, goes and can be done, it can be automated, it's already a help. But you're, I mean, you're of course right. You know, the, the, the measuring um, of how successful it is, this, uh, you know, how close it enables uh, to reach the goal, that has to happen through the actual users by the training. That's something that's that's forthcoming. But um, it doesn't show here. It doesn't only ask you to fill in uh, a single uh, a single word form. It, it actually asks for entire phrases. Right? And I don't know, we're not lucky. We're not getting any. Um, but why why is it switched to Russian? Um, but yeah, there are other <clears throat> there are other ways that this could be um, that this could be stimulated, and other ways that it could be tested. It doesn't just refuses to give me any phrases, right? Not the whole individual. Well, yeah. But you're right. It's, I, I mean, it, it, it it's something that can be questioned and should be tested. Well, speaking from my own experience, because at school we did a lot of these word filling things, but I still didn't. <laughs> Get very good knowledge languages, but I'm very good in this one. Well, I mean, of course, right? I mean, ultimately, the goal would be to have, uh, and some people do this as well in this, in this area, is to enable students to uh, to write free text and then to read. Um, so that's not only for English today, and it's you know, the quality is uh, there, there's very little available, there's very little available. The point, well, the idea is, I mean, to defend it, the idea is that uh, in the process of speaking, let's say, I always have to, if I might know a word, I might know an appropriate word, but it's hard for me to um, uh, to put it in the correct in the correct form, especially if we're focusing on morphologically very complex languages like Finnish and Russian and, and German and things like that. So, um, but there are other types of exercises that could be, uh, or do you mean, well, do you mean this particular type of slot three, or do you mean any yeah, kind of slot three? I guess the key is there that you have all that too much time to think when you are doing a slot three, but when you really, when you need to actively speak something, you don't just have to come, you don't have time to think. Yes. Uh, well, okay, the short answer is yes, you're right. The long answer is there are ways to build in uh, to build in the time dimension here for all these exercises. You can actually put the time constraint on yourself. Either say, okay, I'm going to allow myself 15 seconds per question, or you can compete like this with an opponent who is going faster than you. And you know, so I will, I will lose the game if the if the opponent gets to the bottom three and it's going before me. That, I mean, I I use this all the time. But, even though I built the machine, you know, this puts unbelievable pressure on you. <laughs> to, 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 you know, just seeing that red dot move down faster than myself, it's just, it just changes the, I mean, you're absolutely right, it changes the mode of the exercise completely. And this, this is available for, for other exercises as well, where you have time limitations. So I agree with you 100%. But again, it's not, it's not perfect. We can simulate timing, uh, timing constraints. By the way, this, this opponent here right now is a bot. It could be a friend. 
but right now this is a bot who goes at exactly my speed, what the system learned about me, right? So I'm just trying to beat myself a little bit more, not somebody who's much, much better than me. So it kind of we have some parameters that it learns about how quickly I read and how quickly I answer questions. So it, uh, that's basically me in red, and, and this is me in green trying to beat myself. Yeah, but yeah, uh, I hope I answered your question. We have to take the rest of the questions offline. Yeah.